Okay. Are we recording? Yep. All right. Okay. Lecture two in statics. Let's get started. Okay. Uh, a couple of uh, quick announcements. Um, first off, so uh, attendance seemed to work last time because I uh, went on Google Forms. I had just about everybody here, so I posted those grades to Blackboard. So. If you were here on Monday, you have 100 in the class already. So, yay. Um, uh, some, some updates. Um, it's only downhill from here. So, <laughs> I'm kidding. Not really. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm just playing around. Um, updates. Okay, so first off, I, I had a little bit of a boo-boo. I had updated the course schedule, but not the syllabus. Um, I, use, uh, I have my schedule in Excel, and then uh, my syllabus in Word, and when I merge everything, I put it all in one PDF, but I just uploaded the wrong one, so sorry about that. Uh, you all got an email yesterday with the syllabus, and the syllabus is now uh, up to date on Blackboard, so my apologies for that. Uh, digital paper submissions. I had a student um, yesterday, or uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before, they asked, uh, they use uh, an app, I think, on their iPad to, uh, uh, to do their calculations. They used it in a physics course, and it would convert to PDF. So it'd be like on a, a graph paper, it would be on like graph paper and there'd be their calculations and it would spit out a PDF and they asked if that was fine. I said, absolutely. As long as I have your um, uh, calculations in a reasonably uh, uh, legible and professional uh, fashion, I don't care how you do it. That, that's completely fine. Now the homework uh, for today uh, and the homework on uh, Friday is going to be a little different. Uh, I'm going to pull that up so you can see that. You're actually not going to scan anything in. You're just going to enter in the, the, uh, the answers. But when you see the problems, that, that'll kind of make sense. You'll understand why. Um, recording. So uh, as you uh, know, I record all of my lectures uh, and post them to a, a, to a, a course YouTube playlist. The uh, first lecture is available. Uh, I, I posted that yesterday. Um, if you look, uh, I don't know if, if any of you have gotten onto the Teams channel yet for the class, but I posted a message on Teams letting everybody know that the lecture was available just so that you see that. And also, it's a good idea to get on Teams if you haven't yet uh, downloaded that and put it on your laptop at a minimum or maybe even your phone if you would like. Um, if you go onto the Teams channel for the, um, for the course, uh, up top uh, you'll see these uh, headings and there'll be a thing called class notebook. Uh, if you click that and then on the left if you navigate to content library that'll uh, access the class notes uh, or the, the, the class notebook for the class. This will be where I do all of the example problems, everything on the board uh, and we're going to use that today. Uh, so when we're done if you miss something it's all available to you all 24-7. So uh, that's uh, just for your records. Don't worry we'll, we'll use that today. Uh, so your first homework, again, it's going to be assigned today. It's due Friday, uh, and then we'll have one Friday, due Monday, and we'll keep going down uh, that uh, pattern. Uh, any questions in terms of logistics or announcements, anything like that? Everybody good? Okay. All right. So what are we talking about today? So this course is, you know, a course looking at, at forces and, and, uh, and, and moments on various uh, systems, on bodies, on rigid bodies, on particles, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it makes sense to do a, a pretty brief review uh, of physics, and we need to talk about uh, units uh, and some dimensional analysis today. Um, I'll go ahead and tell you that if you have already had uh, Physics 211, uh, University Physics 1, or if you have any sort of physics background, probably what I'm going to uh, do today will be a little, I don't want to say boring, but you'll have seen this stuff before. Uh, if you have yet to take physics or are in physics now, uh, which is also a possibility. Um, if you haven't already talked about this stuff, you're going to very quickly. Now, I am going to throw a little bit of calculus in the lecture today, but we're not going to use any calculus for the problems or for the, uh, the, um, uh, for, for the examples uh, it's, uh, or your homework. Uh, it's really just a means of explaining what's going on. So we're going to do a very, very brief review of physics and only the physics that really matters to us in this class, which if you take physics 211, we're only going to be reviewing, I don't know, maybe the first week or so. Like that's, that's really all that we need in here, but we're going to use that quite a bit. Uh, so I want to start off by talking about classical motion. Um, this is the, the you, know, you know, sort of day one stuff that you talk about uh, in physics. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by considering, you know, just an object that's moving, you know, uh, moving, you know, across some, some 
region across space, you know, for some time t. Uh, and so, you know, what we might do is we might um, model that, uh, that object's position by some function x or x of t, you know, if you want to uh, look at it like that. So I think um, it's pretty reasonable that you all probably heard that the velocity of that, um, that uh, uh, particle of that object uh, is defined by its change of position over time. And if we're talking about rates of change, calculus land tells us that infinitesimal or instantaneous rates of change are defined by derivatives. So the velocity of a, of a particle is defined by it, the rate of change of its position with respect to time or the derivative of its position with respect to time. Uh, is everybody okay with that concept? Right? And so um, that's what uh, uh, an object's velocity is defined by. And then an object's acceleration is the rate of change of its velocity. How, uh, you know, its velocity is, let's say it's, you know, 50 miles per hour. And then its acceleration is how long or how fast did it take to get to that 50 miles per hour. So its acceleration uh, is the rate of change of velocity or the, set, or the derivative of, of velocity with respect to time or the second derivative of position with respect to time. Now, um, one thing that um, might seem a little strange uh, if you haven't been exposed to this yet is if you look at some of these formulas, it may seem like I, I, I didn't know how to use a formula editor because some of these uh, symbols are bold and some of them are not. Okay, That is actually on purpose. Um, there is a reason that some of the symbols are bold and some of them are not. Um, and I'll give you the, the, the spoilers. Uh, the bold symbols refer to a, a mathematical object called a vector. Okay. In fact, if you look at the cover of your textbook, the name of this book for, for this course is Vector Mechanics for Engineers. Okay. Vectors in your textbook are going to be uh, referred to with bold letters. Um, we're going to have a, a different way of doing it by hand. Um, but vectors are mathematical objects that contain both a magnitude and a direction. Um, and so it's, they're very important for, um, for describing physical quantities. You know, uh, uh, it, it's one thing to say, um, how far is it to get from one city to another? Well, it's 100 miles, or it's 100 miles that way. Okay? The, the, the vector is the object that contains both the magnitude and the direction, and it's sort of uh, uh, is, is the primary tool that we'll use to describe just about any uh, 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 statics-based and dynamics-based uh, situation as engineers. So it's an incredibly valuable uh, and important tool. So now what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the laws that govern uh, motion. Uh, so I would imagine that even if you haven't had physics, at some point or another, you would have at least heard of Newton's three laws of motion. And so there are, you know, oodles and oodles of different ways of, of parsing these out. But the long story short is that the first law is that an object that is in rest or in motion will remain at rest or in motion until it's acted upon by an outside force. Uh, the second law states that an object's rate of change of momentum is proportional to the applied force. So basically, if you remember the classic formula, force equals mass times acceleration, it's basically saying that a... Uh, an, the, uh, the, the object's uh, acceleration is proportional to the applied force, and that constant of proportionality is the object's mass. So, um, uh, so I, I think you probably are pretty familiar with that. And then the, uh, the third law, uh, you've probably heard the uh, adage, uh, uh, you know, every action is an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, all forces between two objects exist in equal magnitude uh, in op opposite direction. Um, now, Newton's law of universal gravitation um, is not something that we will use directly, um, but we will use a specific subset of this uh, for computing weights, um, which I think you, most of you are probably pretty familiar with. So Newton's law of gravitation states that two objects or two particles uh, with two masses that are separated by some distance are mutually attracted to each other. And we can compute the, uh, the magnitude of these uh, forces uh, with the, the following expression, where we have a, a universal gravitational constant times the product of the two masses divided by the distance between them squared. Um, we don't, just to be clear, we don't need to use this particular expression uh, very much uh, in engineering mechanics. But what we do need to do is recognize, well, let's look at a, a specific case. So a specific case might be 
consider an object that's on the surface of the Earth, right? So if we look at an object that's on the surface of the Earth, so we'll take uh, the two objects, uh, object one being the Earth and object two being whatever we're looking at. Um, so M1, or, so the big M being the mass of the Earth, little m being mass of the object, and R being the radius of the Earth, the distance between the center of the Earth and the center of the object, what we can do is we can rearrange the formula and we can compute the weight of the object. And so what we do is we say, all right, let's take uh, this formula, rearrange it, solve it for, uh, uh, for F, and this constant here, the universal gravitational constant times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth squared, well, by golly gosh, gee, that's the acceleration due to gravity. So uh, if you go to you know, any physics textbook, you can find the acceleration due to gravity. I imagine that um, uh, you all are probably familiar with one of these two terms. Probably if you took physics 211, you remember 9.81 meters per second squared. Everybody remember that term? That's where that term comes from. It's just the universal gravitational constant times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth squared. You plug and chug, that's, that's what you get. Now, um, technically, you know, this would depend on where we are on the planet Earth because, you know, if we're, let's say, in Miami versus we're in, or, you know, we're on top of Mount Everest, we're further away from the center of the Earth, but for purposes of what we're talking about in here, we're engineers, we're you know, that, that doesn't really matter all that much. Uh, for the purposes of engineering computations, it's sufficient to use these values. Now, this brings up uh, an interesting point uh, in this class, uh, and it's a question I get pretty commonly on day one, which is, what are we, are we using SI units or are we using US units in here? What are we using? And the answer is both. Um, we're we're going to utilize both. We've got uh, engineers in here with a, from a variety of disciplines, you know, civil engineers, mechanical engineers, biomedical engineers, and uh, uh, utilizing both unit systems is going to be valuable uh, for, for, your, for your negotiation of this course. But one of the things that's worth mentioning is that the unit conversions that you need to do in here are not incredibly difficult. If you remember, we... Um, uh, we, we defined at the very beginning that mechanics was the study of forces. It was the study of uh, bodies and systems that are being subjected to forces. And so when we're doing problems, we're primarily going to be dealing with forces and distances. And as long as all of those units are consistent, the unit conversion issue really isn't going to be very difficult. I'll go ahead and tell you, so if you take a course like Mechanics of Materials, the unit conversions in there get a little more tricky than they do in here. They're actually really, really basic in here. It's not very difficult. Um, so it's probably just a good idea to have both of these uh, values sort of tucked away in the back of your head, that the uh, acceleration due to gravity in SI units is about 9.81 meters per second squared, uh, and according to US units, it's 32.2 feet per second squared. Um, we will use that occasionally, but as, even as we get later on in the semester, we end up dealing with forces directly, and we end up not using it all that much. Any questions? In terms of physics, that's pretty much all you need to know right now. That's, that's it. Um, and again, I'm not making you compute, you know, acceleration, you know, with respect to time. I'm not going to give you a position vector and have you you know, differentiate it twice or anything like that. We're, we're not doing that. Okay, let's talk about unit systems. Um, so we do have two unit systems that we utilize in here. We have SI units and uh, US customary units or uh, USCS. Uh, and I do want to talk a little bit about dimensional analysis because that is a skill that, that you just need to be able to utilize as engineers, period. And so this is a good time to talk about it. So for mechanics, for what we're talking about in here, I have here a table which shows the, um, the standard unit systems that we utilize uh, in you know, either unit system. Um, so, for instance, if we're talking about uh, the international system of units, so the standard unit of length for us is going to be the meter. Uh, the standard unit of mass is going to be the kilogram. You know, for time, our standard unit is seconds, and that's going to be the case for both unit systems. Um, and what we find is that some of the other units sort of get derived off that. So, for instance, velocity. Velocity, our standard unit is meters per second, but that's just off of the base units from before. You know, the base unit for length is meters, base unit for time is second, so velocity just gets derived from those. Sort of the, uh, the, the um, 
I guess, sort of special unit in SI units are the ones that, that sort of get its own designation is the Newton. Uh, and the Newton is the standard unit for force. And a Newton is defined as one kilogram times one meter per second squared. I imagine in physics you all have already seen, if you had physics, you've seen this before, am I correct? Okay, good. Now in U.S. units, um, we already have sort of a standard unit for force. It's sort of the other way around. So our standard unit for length is feet. Um, our standard unit for time is, of course, seconds. Now what we do in SI is we take the units of mass, length, and time to develop a unit for force. And in U.S. units, we take the standard units for length, time, and force to develop a unit for mass. And so the standard unit for mass in, uh, in US units is called the slug. And so the slug is basically taking the force unit and dividing it by acceleration. So it's one pound divided by one feet per second squared. Uh, but again, this course is a course that discusses forces, not masses. So we will rarely deal with slugs uh, in here. So it's just something to keep in mind. We will use them, but very, very rarely. Okay. SI unit, prefixes. Um, so uh, we will deal with SI units quite a bit in here. Uh, and you do need the ability to um, uh, move back and forth between various prefixes. Now, if you open a physics textbook or a chemistry textbook or something like that, you're going to get a table that looks like this. And it's got all the different prefixes from, you know, what is it, past Terra all the way down to Atto. I mean, like, you know, we're talking about super gigantic scale down to, you know, smaller than an atom and everything in between. The ones in yellow are the ones we're going to pretty much use in here. Um, uh, and, and I not just say in here, but, you know, I, I, you know, was in college for 10 years, you know, between undergrad all the way to my PhD. And granted, I am a civil engineer. Um, I'm not, you know, looking at nanomaterials or anything like that. But in my entire career, I really never used anything beyond those yellow ones. So that's just me being practical and telling you that's, that's pretty much what it's going to be. But as long as you can convert back and forth, uh, you should be pretty good. Okay, some additional notes on units. Uh, in USCS units, we are uh, also going to be dealing with inches. So um, I, I know that US units, for some of you SI purists, I know that um, SI units are, or US units are a little wonky, you know, three feet in a yard, 12 inches in a feet. I understand that, but, you know, it's civil engineering. I, I was uh, lecturing in structural analysis earlier, and I, I totally understand the mathematical basis and the simplicity of the SI system. But the facts are, when you go to Home Depot and you buy lumber, you buy two by fours. You know, you go buy measuring uh, uh, tapes at, at Home Depot, they're in inches and feet. And so that's the system that we utilize. So, you know, it's teach you what's actually being used, not, you know, what should be or whatnot. Now, uh, a, another unit that is going to pop up that I'm not sure if you've heard about is the KIP, okay? The KIP is a very, very common unit in civil engineering applications, uh, and we're going to use it quite a bit in here. A KIP is just an abbreviated term for 1,000 pounds. So if I say that this column has 12 KIPs on it, that means it has 12,000 pounds. So... We're going to use KIPs quite a bit uh, in here, so that is something that you're going to want to uh, be aware of. Okay, I'm going to stop there for a second and see if anybody has any questions, and then we're going to do some examples together of some unit conversions. Okay, any questions? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to do some unit conversion uh, examples, and we're going to convert the following, and this is just really to um, shake the rust off. Again, if you've had a physics course or, or even a chemistry course, this is probably going to be maybe a little boring, but the idea is we want to make sure everybody's on the same page. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the following unit conversions. We're going to convert 73 miles per hour to meters per second, uh, and then we're going to convert a pressure or stress, uh, however you want to look at it, of 63.9 uh, PSI to um, kilonewtons per meter squared. So what I'm going to do uh, and I want to show everybody how we're going to access this because I mentioned this earlier. So if you go to Microsoft Teams, again, you go to the class notebook. Uh, and something like this should pop up. It's probably somewhat similar for you. Um, and then, let's see, there's a little book over here. Uh, and then you'll go to content library. 
And inside that folder, you will see the, the calculations we're about to do. I already have it open here on a browser. So if you go into content library, you can see units and dimensional analysis. And you can see that's that note I wrote last time, that little hello. Um, again, if you open your laptop right now, and I have no problem if you all bring your laptops with your class. It doesn't bother me at all. Um, if you open your laptop, you will see all the notes that we are about to do together. Okay. Before we get do, uh, uh, going into this example, if you have a calculator, I'm going to be calling on a couple of y'all throughout the semester. I want to make sure that you're engaged. So it's a good idea to bring your calculators to class. So now you can hear that rustle of that. Oh, Dr. Mike's getting us, having us bring his calculator up. All right. Okay. Now I am going to erase this note here because I kind of need the space. Okay. So I'm going to do this in a format that's probably pretty familiar to you. I remember when I was first learning how to do unit conversions like this. This is kind of how it was done in chemistry. Like I first learned how to do this in chemistry. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, let's, let's start with this first problem. Okay. So we have 73 and I'm going to write it like this. Miles per hour. Okay. And I'm going to write it as a fraction. Okay, and in order to do this unit conversion, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep multiplying this fraction by a form of the number one. Okay, uh, everybody in, in here knows that if you take a number and you multiply it by one, you get the same thing you started with. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply it by forms of one, but forms of one with context. Okay, so let me show you what I mean by that. All right, let's start with the time. Okay. How many minutes are in an hour? 60. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write one hour is 60 minutes. Now, obviously, numerically, that is 1 over 60. 1 over 60 doesn't equal 1. I, I understand that. But one hour equals 60 minutes, right? They're the same thing. And if I take a value and divide it by itself, I get 1, right? So what I'm doing is I'm multiplying this expression by a form of 1. That's why I'm allowed to do that mathematically. Now, the way that I arranged that, why did I put the hours on top? Like, why didn't I put 60 minutes over 1 hour? Why did I put 1 hour over 60 minutes? Because when I multiply these, I'm going to have an hour on the top and an hour on the bottom, and I want those to cancel. Make sense? That should be pretty straightforward. And again, if you got questions, don't hesitate. This is what we're here for. Again, y'all are putting cash money on the table to be here, so don't, don't hesitate to ask questions. So in terms of time, am I done, or do, do I need to do something else? You gotta go to seconds. I got to go to seconds. And so what do I need to put here? One minute, 60 seconds. There you go. One minute over 60 seconds. So far, so good. So if I were to multiply that, I'd get a really small number because it would be so many miles per second, right? And then you think about the, the context there. That would, be a, that would be a really tiny number. Now let's do the distances, okay? <clears throat> now I was given a little bit of a, a, a factoid up here that I know that one feet equals 0 0.3048 meters, but I don't have feet. I have miles. Anybody know how many feet are in a mile? There we go. I think that was that was the civil engineers in the room. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But yeah, 5,280 feet in a mile. So 5,280 feet in one mile. And now what I can do is I can utilize this fact over here of um, one um, one feet, and I'll put the feet on the bottom. Is 0 0.3048 meters. So, if I follow the cancellation of units, right, anything that's on the top and on the bottom cancels. So I've got an hour on the top and an hour on the bottom, that cancels. I've got a minute on the top and a minute on the bottom, that cancels. I've got miles on the top, miles on the bottom, that cancels. I've got feet on the top, feet on the bottom, that cancels. And what am I left with? Meters on the top, seconds on the bottom. And that's what I was after. I was after meters per second. And that's what I've got. Meters per second, second on the bottom, meters on the top. And then in terms of what do I do in my calculator? 
Well, it's pretty straightforward. All I do is I say 73 times 1 times 1, and you can probably ignore that in your calculator, times 5280 times 0 0.3048. I'll put those in parentheses. Divided by 60 times 60 times 1 times 1. So you can probably ignore the 1s. Which, by the way, I'm a human being. If, uh, if there's some reason you can't read my handwriting, let me know. Um, it will hurt my feelings because you'd be insulting my handwriting, but I'll try and fix it. I, and by the way, I am a dad, so I'm going to throw some dad jokes out there at some point to try and wake everybody up <laughs> in the afternoon. Okay. Does somebody have an answer for me for this? Like if you chug these numbers into your calculator, does anybody have an answer for me? We'll say to two decimal places. Yes, sir. Or, well, you and then you. 32.63 meters per second. 32.63. One of the things I always do in my classes is, is, I, is I'll ask for a value and then I'll ask for somebody to second it. Do you? Same, yeah. yeah, so you gave me the answer and you seconded it. So there you go. So And I do that just to make sure everybody's awake and attentive. So 32.63. And so the answer is 32.63 meters per second. Yes? That's a great question. Significant figures. Oh, man. That's, that's a great question. So let me talk a little bit about significant figures. Um, I have honestly never emphasized it too much in uh, what I do in statics. Um, if you want to report your answer to significant figures, go all at it. I'm totally fine with that. Usually what I will do in problems is say something like round to the nearest two decimal places. Uh, and when I accept answers, if you know what you're doing and the answer is plus or minus, you know, a hundredth or something, I'm fine with that. I've never really gotten too worked up over that. Um, let's, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a meme on the internet and there's this curve and it's, it's like the level of math that you use as a function of your time and, and uh uh, your education, and, and it's for engineers, and it'll say, okay, algebra, trig, calculus, diffy Q, spreadsheets. Yeah. <laughs> and the facts are, when you all get out of here, and you're practicing, and you're real-world engineers, I can't tell you how many spreadsheets you're going to use, how many software packages that you're going to use. It's going to do a lot of this stuff for you. I think you need to understand significant figures. I do, but I just, I've never really been worked up over it, honestly. Um, I can't tell you, I mean, I could, don't get me wrong, there, there have been some, some engineering disasters as a result of, of you know, stuff like this, but it's usually more on the, the communication and, and the, the human error than it is, you know, the, I don't know what happened there, uh, than some rounding that far. Like, if you have a bridge that's fallen because you did the math and it's holding up 62, 16.2 kips as opposed to 16.1. There's usually something else wrong. So I'm just being the realist with you. So no, I'm not really worried about it. Any other questions? That's a good. That's a very good question. Any other questions? Okay, let's do another one. This one's I, I want to say maybe a little trickier because you kind of have to think about what's going on here. We need to convert um, 63.9 pounds per square inch to kilonewtons per square meter, okay? And those squares are what's going to make things kind of interesting. So I'm going to do this down here. Um, now, a couple things. First off, so that I don't scroll too much here, let me write, um, let me do this. Let me, uh, let's see. Uh, I'll just, I'll just scroll. It'll be all right. I'm going to have to use these uh, unit conversions up here for this problem, but I'll worry about that later. Um, one of the things that you are seeing that might be a little unique is this LB sub F. That LB sub F is just indicating that what we're looking at is a force. There are differences between uh, expressing pounds as a function of force and expressing pounds as a function of mass. You'll talk about that later in some of your other courses. I, I just put that there just so that you see it and can reference it later. But for our purposes, you could just treat that as, uh, as pounds. Okay. So what I'm going to do first off 
is I'm going to use that conversion that was up there before uh, this, um, where'd it go? I'm going to use this uh, conversion right here, and I'm just going to say, uh, oh, I can, I can probably leave that up here and still right. yeah. So we'll say um, 4.44822 newtons to one pound force. So that'll get us to, um, that will get us to newtons. Now, the answer is in kilonewtons. Does anybody know how I'm going to do that conversion? How do I convert from newtons to kilonewtons? Divide it by 1,000. And the reason why you're doing that is because one kilonewton equals 1,000 newtons, right? So the way I always thought about that is, you know, goes back to what I was saying before. I need the newtons on the bottom so that I can get kilonewtons on top, right? I want, I want to cancel the newtons. And I know that one kilonewton is a thousand newtons. Ooh. Okay. So far so good? Now, I've got inches there, okay? Inches. How do I convert from inches to feet? What's the conversion factor? Twelve, right? But we got we gotta think about that, okay? So the conversion factor states that 12 inches equals one foot. But that's only going to do this once, right? This is inches. This is square inches. Anybody know how I'm going to handle that? I'm going to do it again, right? Or square it, right? The idea is that there are 12 inches in a foot, but there's 144 square inches in one square foot. Like imagine like a checkerboard that's just a little bit longer. Like think how many squares there are, how many square inches are in, uh, are in one square foot. And so I'm going to do that again. 12 inches into one foot. And so what that'll do is that'll cancel that, but then cancel that and cancel that. So I cancel two. Okay. Last thing that I need to do is I'm, I'm trying to convert this from feet to meters. So I've got that conversion factor up top that says one foot is 0 0.3048 uh, meters. So there I've got that, but what do I have to do? I got to do it again because it's square feet to square meters. And that'll do it, right? Because let's follow this out. Let's see what we get in the end, right? Cancel the pounds, cancel the pounds, cancel the newtons, cancel the newtons, left with kilonewtons. Cancel the inches, cancel the feet, cancel the feet, left with meters. Uh, mouse go. There it is. It's kind of dark. It's hard to see. All right, so let's get a couple other folks besides my uh, folks that, that uh, answered and seconded last time. Somebody else give me an answer for this value. We've got 36.71. 36.71. Do I have a second on that? That's, that's not what I'm getting. Anybody else have a value? It's okay. I mean, that's what we're here to do. You know, it's possible there's a uh, either a, maybe a plus in there, or you forgot a twelve or something. It's okay. Yes. Four hundred and forty point fifty-seven. Do I have a second on that? There we go. We got multiple seconds. There we go. See, so yeah, a four forty point. 57 kilonewtons per meter squared. And just so you are uh, apprised this, it won't affect anything in this class, but does anybody know what a newton per meter squared is called? Anybody know that? Sure. No, no, it's called a Pascal. So, uh, so what we would, we could also call this um, 440.57 kPa.
All right, I want to stop for a second and see if this makes sense. And for the one that uh, had the 36, did you get the 440? Did you get it? Yeah. Good. Is everybody else good? Anybody else having trouble? That's what we're here to do. Are we good? All right. So, yeah, so that should be pretty straightforward. And before we move on to sort of a, a next topic, I want to show you how your homework is going to work. So here's the, uh, the Blackboard page. Let me refresh it because it's actually live now. So this is your first homework assignment. It's right here. I'm not going to pull it up right now, but I'll, I want to just forewarn you. It's going to look like a test, but it's not, okay? It doesn't have a time limit. You can stop it and come back to it. You can actually submit it again. Like, this is just to get us started. Um, the way that it works is it's going to ask you two unit conversion problems, very similar to what we just did in here. And the way that I uh, 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 built the problem, and this goes to the question earlier, is it has an answer, but there's a little bit of a range. So if for some reason some of you round things a little differently, it should handle that. And so if for some reason you get the answer, uh, an answer wrong, you can submit, and then you can submit again. Again, this is just our first homework assignment. I just want you all to get familiar with using Blackboard. You won't need to scan uh, a PDF or anything for this homework. You just go in, do the problem, submit it. There you go. Yeah, in fact... Probably if class ends at 1.50, you could probably be done with this problem by 2 o'clock. It's, it's really, really not very, uh, very challenging. Everybody good? But again, it's going to look like a test, but it's not. So, Okay. Now, all right, so being able to convert from one unit system to another or convert a quantity from one unit to another is an integral task to an engineer. And I know it seems simple, but I'm telling you, I, so I'm a civil engineering faculty, I'm a structural engineer, and I teach courses from the freshman level to the graduate level and everything in between. And I'll teach upper level reinforced concrete design and structural seal design. And I'm telling you, I still have students that, that have issues with the unit conversions, okay? So it's definitely something that you want to make sure that you're comfortable with. It's not difficult, you just want to make sure that you're comfortable with it. Okay. I want to talk to you about something called dimensional analysis. Um, this is um, uh, sure it's related to, to unit conversions and whatnot, but basically what it's intended to do is ensure that a, uh, uh, an expression is consistent with unit systems that go into it uh, and, the, and the parameters that go into it. Um, this is a, a, a very... Uh, a, a useful skill for an engineer, especially if you're deriving your own expressions or your own uh, equations on, on, you know, handling a given problem. You know, if you're uh, uh, working for a, I don't know, a, 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 a you know, service pump and supply and you have a spreadsheet that you're building to, to size pumps for an industrial operation and you're building it yourself, this is something that you kind of need to be able to do to ensure that everything's coming out uh, correctly. So I'm going to show you a formula uh, that, that um, students in my CE312 class learn how to derive uh, later on in the semester. This is a beam, uh, and let's say the beam is being subjected to a load in the, in the very middle. Now, if you remember, uh, in this course I told you we're dealing with rigid body mechanics, but there's nothing in this world that's perfectly rigid. Everything deforms, okay? And in structural analysis, we need to understand how much deformation there is so we can ensure the beams don't deflect too much. You wouldn't like it if you were sitting in this, uh, in this uh, uh, stadium seating room and these beams were sagging like two feet. You wouldn't like that, right? So the, the support system under the floor needs to be strong enough to resist that, although you know, we're on grades, so that's not a big deal uh, in here. Um, the formula for computing the uh, uh, deflection for, a, uh, for a, a, a simply supported beam is this formula right here. It's PL cubed divided by 48 EI, okay? And if we use U.S. units, P is the applied load. That's, that's however much this is. Is it you know, 200 pounds, 400 pounds, however much that is. L is the length of the beam. And so if we wanted to use consistent units, we might need to express the beam length in inches. Um, e is a material property called the elastic modulus. Every engineering material has a unique elastic modulus. So steel has a unique E value, aluminum, concrete, wood, uh, pla different plastics, etc. They all are characterized by their unique uh, E value. And I is this term called the moment of inertia. We'll actually talk about how to compute moments of inertia in here. 
but basically it is a measure of how uh, uh, flexurally stiff uh, a given beam is. So I'll give you uh, an example of where that's useful. How many of you uh, have ever been on a deck in your backyard or have a house that has a deck in the backyard, right? And so if you look at the floor beams under the deck, you know, you've got these, what, 2 by 8s 2 by 10s whatever. Notice, you notice how they're upright? They're oriented upright, and they're not sitting flat. Like the floor beam, the, the, the planks are sitting flat, but the actual beams that are providing the strength of the deck are facing like this. The reason why is because oriented this way, those beams have a higher moment of inertia this way than they do that way. So a little bit of engineering you know, trivia for you. Uh, and so I is a, a property of the shape and its orientation. Uh, and so if you plug that in, that'll tell you how much it's deflecting. So you can see here's the beam flat, here it's curved, and so however much it's deflecting, that's the formula that'll tell you. So if I wanted to know how much the deflection would be, I would imagine that the deflection should come out in inches, right? Because I'm trying to figure out if it's deflecting three inches or four inches down, right? And so the formula tells me PL cubed over 48 EI. Well, what happens? P is in pounds, length is in inches, so I'm cubing that. The E, that's in the, like this PSI term, so pounds over inches squared. The moment of inertia, that's a weird property. The, uh, the units are in inches to the fourth. So it's, it's kind of strange, but it's like you're taking an area and multiplying it by a distance squared. So that's kind of why it comes out inches to the fourth. But if you chug this out, what you find is that the pounds in the fraction cancel, and then you get inches to the third over inches squared, and it cancels, and by golly gosh, gee, you get inches, which is what you wanted. Okay? So you want to make sure that the units that you're plugging into it result in an answer that makes sense. That's sort of what dimensional analysis is all about. Does that make sense? Now, don't worry. You're not going to have to do this on your homework assignment. And I built some buffer into the lecture because I knew we weren't going to get to this today. But the idea is that what, uh, what we're going to do, and we'll probably start right at this example on Friday, is... This is a similar formula. This is for all you fluids folks in the room. This is the uh, expression that we use to determine the total amount of energy in a, uh, in a pipe or in, in a fluid conduit. And there's really three different terms. And we, we call the, uh, the uh, expression uh, of energy in fluid mechanics, we call it head because it's a function of the, basically the elevation from, uh, from a given datum. It's one of the, like, when you're designing a, a water tower, if you've ever seen a, uh, a town with a water tower, the idea is to get that water to a certain height because the higher it is, the more energy uh, is supplied to the town for all the drinking water and toilet flushing and, and what have you. And so there's three expressions uh, for, uh, for fluid pressure or for, flu sorry, for fluid energy. There's the expression or there's the, the component that comes from the fluid pressure there's the expression that comes from the fluid velocity, and there's the expression that comes from the elevation. So we call it pressure head, velocity head, and elevation head. And if you notice in that energy expression, we're adding them up. So we have E equals you know, a pile of junk plus another pile of junk plus a third pile of junk. So if I'm adding these three expressions, they better be dimensionally consistent. Like I can't add you know, three meters plus four pounds, right? It's got to be meters plus meters plus meters, or kips plus kips plus kips, or so on and so forth. So what we need to do is we need to investigate this expression and see if it is dimensionally consistent, right? That's what we're going to do on, uh, on Friday. To be crystal clear, this is not on your homework uh, that's due Friday. This will be on your homework Friday, due Monday, okay? So this is not uh, a, uh, uh, anything you got to worry about today. What we're going to do on Friday is we're going to do this example, and then before we get kicked off into statics, starting next week, we're going to look at some math review. So if today was about physics review, uh, Friday is going to be about math review. And it's uh, primarily going to focus on trig, because if there's any one mathematical skill that is super critical to what we do in here, at least starting off, I think it's the trig. So we'll talk a little bit about stuff like that. You might want to just... If you're bored and don't have anything to do uh, your first week of class, might see if you remember things like the law of sines, law of cosines, all that you know, fun stuff, uh, and what have you. Any questions? 
you made it through your second lecture, only, what, 39 to go? So that's all I got, everybody. We will see you all on Friday.